Um, yeah, such a big uh, topic really um, <laughs> yeah. to, to take on. But let me start by saying something about the response uh, in Greater Manchester. So um, I'm sure Judith will say something similar. Uh, in a space of five weeks or so, we've had to stand up completely new systems, um, both ourselves at the combined authority and our 10 districts as well, and much of it was working with each other. Um, and the summary I would say as we sit here today is that we've stood up well. Um, the NHS um, has um, managed the pressure, although it remains very, very challenging. Um, we um, have seen in the last few days um, a significant reduction in the number of daily admissions to hospital uh, with people um, with COVID-19. Uh, but of course, there are still a lot of people still in hospital, so it's not in any way a sense that the pressure is relieving. But it does feel as though we're going through and just beyond the peak, I think, at the, at, at the moment, although you know, we can't be um, complacent uh, about that. Um, I think it's brilliant what's been done, to be honest. Um, we, um, as a devolved health system, have been operating a system of mutual aid um, on PPE. So hospitals have been helping social care. Um, hospitals and councils have been working together. Um, it's been fantastic, actually, to see the level of cooperation. We stood up a, um, a GM procurement unit for PPE. Um, so we, we got out early to um, try and buy PPE ourselves. Um, and we've succeeded actually in placing orders for far more than we will get through the government uh, system. And actually it's not just cooperation within GM. Uh, Leeds, I think Judith might, uh, I, I don't want to take the, the credit because it was a, a Leeds offer uh, to um, uh, collaborate with them on procurement of some PPE. So, you know, the levels of um, innovation and cooperation across not just our own city region, but uh, the Pennines as well has been been fantastic actually to 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 see and um, people and communities and organisations have stood up well. Um, in terms of lessons from this phase, and this is where devolution comes in, Jill. Uh, I, I, I guess Ju uh, Judith will say something similar. There hasn't been enough input from the regional or local level into some of the things that the government has been has been doing. So you know on PPE. Obviously, they should have worked with us more, I think. Um, it's not about making political points. I'm just trying to give you what feels to me to be a, a fact, given, given where we are. Um, you know, the government talking about standing up a new national distribution system to get to 60,000 or 56,000 establishments. Well, I don't think they needed to do that. They should have just worked more through us as that last leg of distribution. Um, and that seemingly has not been the way they've gone. And also, these drops that they were doing just have never, well, they finally hit a bit of a rhythm, but it took so long. And it, it would have been better if that was a more decentralized partnership uh, approach, I would say. And then you take an issue like testing. Uh, we had a unit set up at Manchester Airport without any reference to um, colleagues in our NHS or in our councils. Now, if, if we'd have been asked, we'd have all said, look, NHS and social care staff don't find it easy to drive to Manchester Airport on any given day. Uh, and then people are surprised why the testing capacity that's been stood up there is not being used. Well, there's a reason why. Um, and that's a, that's a frustration. We'll take another example. Um, the NHS volunteer scheme that was launched at Speed. I, I don't know what those half, no, three quarters of a million volunteers have been asked to do. Uh, but I assume many of them haven't been asked to do anything. Uh, and so it drew a kind of whole group of really, you know, well-meaning, good-spirited people into a place where they're now not necessarily being used. And that potentially took them away from the community hubs, from councils, from the voluntary organisations that needed those volunteers on, on the ground. So in terms of learnings, you know, I would say those are, are, are some of them. I, as people may have heard me say, dealt with swine flu a decade ago. I understand when the NHS clicks into top-down command and control mode, and much of it is right that it does that. But there have been some obvious uh, failures here to engage people at our, at our level. I, I can't uh, understand why there hasn't been a regional uh, English voice on COBRA. So First Ministers from Wales and Scotland, rightly, Northern Ireland, rightly, Mayor of London, rightly, 
but where's our representation? And it did feel a little to me like leveling up was all flavor of the month and the voice of the North. And then boom, that was all off the table and we were back to the old this default London centric uh, approach. Yeah. Uh, and I don't think that's helped them because if Judith was on Cobra or if I was on it or if Andy Street was on it, we would have put some of these points into them about the way they were managing the uh, PPE or the way they were doing uh, testing. Um, so definitely uh, uh, lessons uh, here, uh, Jill. But mm. I don't make that in any partisan spirit because I know you know how how tough it is for the government to to do these things, and they've done many things well. You know they've stood up a lot of business support very quickly. Um, and the health service has broadly coped with what's been thrown at it. But, um, you know, it's fair to say that things could have been done better. So my point today would be, how do you take the lessons from so far in and now apply them to where we go uh, from here? And what I'm absolutely certain is we cannot have a London-centric approach to recovery or indeed uh, a regional um, approach to lock release from lockdown you know I think there has been a kind of a an idea floated that we do release region by region and I would argue that's probably predominantly been pushed by the London business world that would be uh, the worst of all worlds I think from from our point of view I think we need to have a, a, an approach to uh, release from lockdown that's fair to all parts of the country and I'm attracted actually to the suggestion put forward by Francis O'Grady General Secretary of the TUC, which is a national reconstruction and recovery council. Because the yeah. decisions that will be taken to move us from where we are now on the road towards a new normality, because it will have to be a new normality, I think are so profound that they can't be taken in the way that they've been taken in, in recent times. You know, we have to have a more consensual approach to this across regions, across parties, um, across sectors. So that would be my, you know, my 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 first uh, point. Um, then looking towards, you know, how we manage this. I think it is a reality that, uh, as the chief medical officer was saying yesterday, social distancing will just be something we have to factor into the way we run services, particularly the way we run uh, public transport. So there's no yeah. bounce back to normality here, yeah. uh, and it's going to have to be managed. One thing that we heard from the government at the start of this was spend whatever you uh, need to spend, we'll see you right. But already that message is changing and Judith might want to talk about this more from a local government point of view. But from my point of view, well, on the work we've done on homelessness, it was an everyone in call at the start. And now it's being changed to, well, I will pay for the people who came in who were pre-identified before lockdown, but anyone who's been made homeless since lockdown, well, that's different. So already the, the, the message is, is changing. People may have seen that I'm in an argument with them this week about Metrolink. Yeah. They still haven't put forward a funding package for Metrolink, even though they bailed out the trains and the buses um, some weeks uh, ago. You know, how can we revive the economy in the regions if we've no kind of funding package for a public transport system in Manchester that's lost millions of pounds in the last month or so? but also is gonna to continue to lose money if you're gonna operate it with social distancing. And the government needs to answer these questions so that we can begin to plan for recovery because at the moment we don't have answers uh, to, these, uh, to these questions. Uh, Jill, if I, if I then finish on this point, which um, hmm. I think might um, you know, then um, kind of tee up the wider discussion. I've become increasingly clear that this has to be a reset moment, not, not to return to business as usual, but actually to build back better is the slogan that we're beginning to, to, to use. Yeah. Um, we're all enjoying the clean air. I think we're all seeing more people taking exercise um, in the less congested uh, streets. Everyone's, not everyone, some people are getting the benefits of, of home working. But perhaps, perhaps also we've all seen, as we sit at home and have a seminar like this, the people who are out there still running the country we focus a little more on their working conditions, haven't we, and what they're and what yeah. they're paid. And I think people can see a little more clearly now that we've been overvaluing work in the top half of the economy and undervaluing work in the bottom Absolutely. half of the economy, mm -hmm. uh, as I think Steve said at the beginning. So build back better, I think, needs to sort of kind of respond to all of these all of these uh, themes. 
and this is where where our thinking is going to and we would very much like to do this as a sort of a a northern campaign uh, or even a cross-country campaign you know business unions councils you know making an argument for, for for doing things better so you know on clean air you could give a stimulus to local companies now to smes and taxi companies by pay allow giving them a grant to switch their vehicle to a electric vehicle so you know that would then help them recover yeah. but also it would keep the benefits of clean air and that's mm. you know, one example of how you might build back better mm. you should in my view um create jobs by laying more digital infrastructure now uh, to support people's new ways of working but also obviously create uh, create uh, employment you should get on and give money to councils to build cycling and walking infrastructure uh, to create jobs but also capture the benefit of people sort of thinking differently about how they how they travel and how they how they move around um, there are lots of examples I could give so I won't, won't talk at length but you know it's about investments in the eco regional economy that then really accelerate us towards a new and better future retrofitting of domestic properties would be another one something we know we need to do yeah. if we're to hit our carbon neutrality targets yeah. so why not get on and do it now because it's a new industry and if there's big redundancies in one part of the economy retrain people work with our colleges and move them through into um new industries that could deliver thousands of jobs in manchester leeds or other towns and cities across across yeah. the north but the final thing is coming back to this value of work point because i think this is the point that can't be lost as we think about a recovery um, i think we need to make the argument that you know we've seen people that are essential to the running of of things but the IFS are saying today that they are also they tend to be the lowest paid people in society. Yeah. Now, how can it make sense even from a business point of view, business continuity point of view, mm. that you pay people who are essential to the running of the economy less than the living wage? Because yeah. from a continuity point of view, the people who are essential need to be kind of paid enough to live on, look after their families so that they can be in work every single day and there not be any kind of risks to that essential work. And I think this is an argument that needs to be be advanced. And you know, I think we need we need to start setting the terms of the recovery debate through seminars like this, rather than waiting for some of the national system to start setting recovery on the long wrong lines, where it's trying to claw money back from local authorities, underfunding the homelessness issue that I was I was talking about. Uh, and I I think this is absolutely the space that we need to um, to mm. occupy and um, and occupy. Uh, yeah. now so that will be the way i see things uh, today uh, jill response has, has been okay but there's some things that could have been done better but let's take all of that learning now apply it to recovery mm -hmm. which is going to arguably be longer and harder and if we get recovery off on the right foot i think we might be able to to build back better from here from where we are today so yeah. thank you very much yeah thanks andy that's that's terrific um and you know i think it is very true the, you know, this, you know, pandemic, it's, it's the good, the bad and the ugly, really. Um, and, you know, I'm very pleased to hear that, you know, those positive noises. And I think you know, the, the world has been turned on, it, on its head, really. Um, how we communicate, how we go to work or if we work and, and, you know, what's important. I think it's really great, really, some of those issues, other crises in our society, like social care or housing you mentioned, uh you know uh, all of a sudden getting the airtime and the priority and realization by people that these are really it's a reprioritization almost to sort of say what is really important to people uh and i think it's a great lot so many lessons but we do need to capitalize on that i'm going to quickly get uh judith now to come in um and uh give us her thoughts and views from not just uh a leeds perspective of course but um very much of the the role cities can play uh and you know again uh looking at the positives but also the negatives and where we go from here judith um uh, thank you so much thank you for organizing this event um yeah. great to hear Andy speaking and um, obviously we share 
so much in common in terms of um, being at the, you know, really at the forefront of what has been happening. Um, I just want to start by, you know, asking everyone to really remember the real tragedy of what is happening. And, um, you know, yesterday, uh, over 18,000 hospital deaths from the virus. Um, and what we know is that the death statistics are just not capturing the true picture. Um, we're um, across local government um, trying to get um, recognition um, of the numbers of people who've died in care homes in their own homes, which are just not reflected in the statistics at all. And until we get that real picture of how the pandemic is affecting us and affecting um, you know, such a broad range across our communities, um, you know, not even gathering the statistics um, around ethnic minorities and you know, understanding why there seems to be a disproportional um, impact on, the, on, on those communities um, is something that you know, is very, very live to us in local government. And we really do um, want to make sure that every, um, every single um, person is included in the statistics that come forward. Um, and of course, you know, from a local government perspective, we always um, um, assume quite rightly that when we have an emergency like this, um, you know, whatever it is, um, that we will be absolutely at the center of the response to dealing with it. And, you know, it's no exaggeration that in these circumstances, local government is the fourth emergency service. And um, to, uh, we need to get that across. So it's obviously about protection, but ongoing, it's about support and the support that we need um, to bring in. And we know, and Andy's uh, made reference to this, that all of this and the response we've had to put in place, uh, we know it's going to have a deep impact on our economy. Um, it's going to be drawn out. Um, we don't know how long it's going to go on. We don't know the full extent of it. And it's going to be global. Um, so many um, aspects that we have to take on. But um, I just want to get across the scale of the response that we've had to put in place um, right across um, the country. Um, so, um, I really want to emphasize how important it is that the recognition that our frontline staff are getting now needs yeah. to be recognized permanently. It's, you know, we need to um, get into a frame of mind, you know, at the end of the Second World War, yeah. the slogans sort of homes fit for heroes. We need to put this in place that the new normal cannot go back to people who we absolutely rely on to keep our society going can be treated in the way that they have been treated yeah. in terms of pay, zero hours contract in many cases, all of those things need to be taken on. So it's not just warm words of recognition that is happening now quite rightly, but that is translated into a really firm footing for, for making sure that they're their recognition is rewarded on a, a permanent basis. But so many areas that this covers. So, you know, when we're talking about key workers and we'll be going out to them, and obviously the NHS um, is absolutely central, but, you know, asking everyone to think about the, our bin men, our social care staff in adults and children's services. Um, those people, um, our officers working in our cremations and burial services, um, our, our cleaners across so many settings, the retail sector, um, our schools. Um, are, it's just um, phenomenal, the response that we've had. And of course, as um, we know, people who are continuing to work with the most vulnerable in our society, whether it's um, rough sleepers, those work, you know, trying to reach out to people with mental health problems, some of which are, are being made far worse and not being able to physically go out. All of these challenges that I'm delighted to say that we're stepping up and finding new ways of working to making sure that we help with that um, response. So we couldn't do this on our own in local government. The reason we've been able to do what we do is because of the depth and breadth of our partnerships um, around whether it's our cities, our regions, our districts, 
um, our counties, um, you know, the, you know, working um, with our health colleagues, but also with police um, and with our business communities. And it's that the depth of those relationships that I think has helped us to get um, where we are today. Um, so um, it is frustrating when um, um, you're not going to believe this. Well. I've, I've just got I've just got a window cleaner arrived at my house. <laughs> <laughs> Windows are very important. <laughs> uh, all right, it's going around. <laughs> so, um, so, um, so the real thing um, that we have to stress is that you know on the areas such as PPE testing we know um, you know our response we have got together locally we have stepped up but if we had been unable to do so um, right from the start and been told okay this is what we need this is what we have to do um, you know we'd have um, we'd have been in a much better place today and I think it's um, it's really um, learning from those lessons and making sure um, that we um, we bring them in um, as we go forward. Um, the, um, the, uh, the other example of that, and Andy alluded to it, was you know, the, um, the call out for people to volunteer for a national um, NHS line. Well, that's great, and how many thousands did that? Mm. But actually, if you get that response to local level, you can manage it. There's all sorts of issues around um, working with vulnerable people. They have, to, um, they, you know, they have to make sure that they've got the right in place and you know we've had eight, over 8,000 volunteers in Leeds and we've been able to put an incredible system going out and taking food out making sure the quality of the food is right make, and all of those um, um, additional things and supporting our local pharmacies um, but um, just um, moving on you know um, yes the government has um, enabled us to give support to businesses um, and again we've got 99 million pounds out of the door already um, to support. But um, again, you know, there's so much more that we need to do. I think the fundamental issue for me is the, the country was simply not prepared yeah. for the pandemic. Yeah. And actually, all of the emergency um, work that had been done not that long ago um, told us exactly how we needed to prepare and what we needed to do. That report needs to be made public. It hasn't been made public and it needs to be. And it talks about, you know, how we would have access to PPE and all of those things. But the second thing um, on top of that is that we're, we are now reaping the, re the rewards, if you like, of 10 years of austerity. And really that systematic undermining of public services mm. that not everyone is depending on and that is a, has to be an absolute lesson that we cannot go back the response to the economic crisis that we are going into um, cannot be more austerity we have to turn that argument on its head and really get across just how important and essential um, those areas where we've had to bring in draconian cuts over the last 10 years um, can't be um, allowed to um, continue and as I say, it's the centralised decision making, the idea that, um, um, that these sort of things at a local level can be run from Whitehall. Yeah. It's just to end. And we almost on a daily basis, we're seeing new guidance comes out um, that we have to deal with you know, almost overnight, um, but no reference to us in terms of how that guidance should be framed based on our experience at a local um, level. So, of course, there are some important lessons that we can learn from this. And who, who knew that so many people across so many sectors would be ready to start working remotely through Skype, through Zoom, through all of the other outlets that are available to us? And how, um, how on earth are we going to make sure that that um, uh, continues. I can't, I've talked to so many people who cannot imagine now going back to a situation mm -hmm. where we as local government leaders, mayors are expected to go to London for a half hour meeting, for example, that yeah. continue. 
And so many of us um, have really recognised the impact on our congestion um, going forward. So I think there's, um, there's a lot to learn from that. Um, the real concern in local government is the, uh, is the financial impact it's having on us. Yeah. Um, so we've had two tranches of 1.6 billion have been released to us. Um, there are, it's not ring fence, so which you know, which is one thing we're for. Um, the um, the first um, tranche um, delivered 22 million for Leeds um, on a, a base. We don't know yet. The second tranche was delivered at, announced at the weekend. We don't know yet how that is going to be divided up, and that. Um, is a question in itself. Why don't we um, know? But when I tell you that the city of Leeds alone is already predicting um, the, the cost of this uh, is running around £130 million um, pounds, um, uh, and rising, um, it just shows you how much more, uh, how many more tranches of support the government are going to have. So um, just to pull it together, we need um, recognition for local government. Uh, you know, we, we need all of those words that are being said about how we couldn't have this response without local government, without the mayoral authorities. Um, well, you know, let's get that um, recognition. Um, we need that recognition for our frontline workers, um, um, empowering us at a local level to work together to really um, put, um, our, to enable us to use our local convening powers to bring all of those elements of the economy um, together to make the difference that we need to make. Through yeah. core cities, we've done um, um, an, an, an incredible amount of um, um, work on the inclusive growth agenda, as you know. Yeah. Um, and it's this that will make the difference. Because what we know is that we're going to have a rise in inequality, a rise in poverty, um, people who have lost their jobs um, at an older age, but also younger people not being able to get into the workplace. Yeah. We need to be able to work at a local level to get the skills to find out where the gaps yeah. are, where things are um, emerging to make sure that we've got the staff in place um, to make um, that happen. Um, I um, absolutely agree. And I think, I hope we've got the message through that when we do come in, to coming out of the lockdown, it can't be on a regional basis. That really would be a disaster in my view. So looking at sector by sector, how is that um, going to um, actually happen? Um, one of the areas that we have to get sorted out is our, you know, how will we bring education right across the piece from early years, the real difficulties that nurseries are having at the moment needs to be sorted out. We need to work with our school teachers and all of the education community to get a sensible way that we can get the um, um, children back into, into school so that people can actually go out to work. Um, but also transport is a major issue. And there are examples from around the world that show that the loss of confidence of people going into confined public spaces means that sadly, um, given the impact at the moment on the climate situation, more and more people are more likely to get into their cars or to get yeah. a car to move about because they're so worried about going onto public transport. The tra public transport providers are completely changing their, their marketing, you know, their, 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 their model, knowing that it's going to take a long time to get, um, get back to where it needs to be. Um, and I have to stress the most important thing that we have to do together is to move forward in a structured way, which is why it needs to be locally led, so that we go along taking the public with us. If we don't have public confidence in what we're doing, it isn't going to work. Um, at the moment, the public are um, really taking notice of the messaging to say, at home and to socially distance when they do go out, but we have to make sure that we're working with the public step by step. Mm -hmm. And just to finish, um, Jill, um, obviously devolution. I mean, I think it was almost, a, I think it was a week before lockdown yeah. <laughs> that Yorkshire, West Yorkshire signed yeah. 
the, our devolution deal. We're still moving forward with that in the anticipation that we will, um, uh, that will be up and running in May next year. Um, but if any lesson has come out of this whole experience in terms of economic restructuring, how we move forward, resetting, um, whatever you like to call it, mm. it must be that devolution is more devolution, real devolution, yes. fiscal devolution has to be the way forward. And, and as Andy quite rightly says, there are a plethora of different bodies being set up to talk about the resetting, the recovery. But we need to make sure um, that you know, we're, we're at the table and that, that we're being listened to right now in terms of how we can do what we know we can do, to deliver the strong local leadership to enable us to get through and come out of the other side of the crisis and make sure that um, we are on that journey. We give the greatest amount of protection to people who are really struggling and really suffering right now and will continue to do so for some time to come. Yeah, that's brilliant, Judith and Andy. Thank you very, very much. Um, I'm going to now, um, you've covered so much, and of course, it's such a huge topic, but I think I'd just like to sort of um, call in a, a, a few uh, key questions. There's, there's one, I think, which leads, sort of sets the debate going, um, and I'd like to call Will Macklebeck um, from Core Cities UK. This is not favouritism, uh, <laughs> Judith, but um, they've got a very good question. Um, um, and then I will go to Matthew Grigor, if you're there, Matthew, um, and then the Northern Housing Consortium. So we're going to take those three. Um, and I know, Andy, you may have to leave at some point. Yeah, Jill, I've probably got about 10 more minutes, so apologies. Yeah. So no, 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 I, 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 I knew that. But let's, so if we do that, that would be good. So uh, let's kick off with Will. Um, how, how are you? Your question, please. Good, thank you. Uh, a nice easy one to start. Um, <laughs> is there a danger, given that uh, that some in media that some in media and government will portray the response to COVID nineteen as largely a national response, and that they will ignore local efforts, and that this kind of uh, centrally planned idea could follow through into uh, economic recovery plans for cities and city regions? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, and now to Matthew from Association of British Ports, uh, a, a question on transport. Yes, thanks, Jill, and thanks to both the speakers. Um, looking towards the recovery and building back better, I'm keen to know how, how you think we can still deliver the transport and infrastructure investment in the north and elsewhere that's needed to drive economic growth where it's most needed. Yeah, I mean, there's a big concern, I think, for all of us, given how much was promised uh, and, you know, from HS2 and uh, the whole thing. I think it's a, certainly from, I think, both your perspectives that sort of how that debate actually ends up is, is a big concern, I think. Um, and as you've already mentioned, Judith, yourself, about how people will travel or not travel, uh, you know, puts big questions over the economy. Uh, another really key point is uh, from Sati Ray from the Northern Housing Consortium. Sati. Hi, thank you, Jill. Yeah, um, we've all spent more time at home over the last few weeks, but there are 1.5 million homes in the North that don't meet the decent home standard, and almost half of these are home to someone older or with a disability or long-term illness, basically those people who need to basically stay at home or shield for the longest how will lockdown change our attitudes to housing and how can we ensure that improving the North's existing homes is part of the economic and social response to COVID-19? Yeah, that's brilliant. Um, so three, three really good questions there, I think. Um, and so I'm going to go to Andy first and then, uh, but we can interact a little bit uh, if you just, just want to jump in. Okay. Well, firstly, uh, thanks, Will, for your question. Um, is there a danger um, that we'll see a very top-down approach to recovery, uh, then yes, absolutely. You can understand it more with, with, with response. You know, in any national emergency, you, you will get a top-down uh, approach. 
And that's going to be right. I mean, all I was saying is they should have had a bit more regional input to that top-down uh, response. Uh, and then we'd have had a better national response. But it, it cannot possibly be right for recovery. Because recovery will be different in Leeds than it is in Manchester. There's just different issues. You know, if Judith's right that it's a sector-by-sector -sector release. And I think that is uh, where thinking should be going. Mm -hmm. Obviously, there are different sectors with a different presence in different parts of the country. And, uh, you know, decisions on the sequencing will affect some areas more than others. So this cannot all just be driven nationally. You're going to have to empower uh, council leaders like, like Judith, mayors and CAs like we have in GM to work with people at a local level to make, you know, recovery will be testing on every single level for people. And it just mm. cannot be driven by people far away from these places uh, who kind of have no idea how they, how they tick. So this is a danger, Will. It's why I think I'd like to see more people get behind Francis O'Grady's suggestion, because it is about a sort of, you know, a consensual forum across sectors, um, business, trade unions, regions, so that these things can be sort of debated, you know, and I think it's such an important thing. But once decisions are reached, best and empower the cities and the city regions to sort of drive things uh, from, uh, from the bottom up. Because uh, I think that in the end will be the only way we can make sense of, of recovery. Uh, but it does need voices coming through now to sort of say, look, the, re the response phase was done that way and we understand why, but it can't be the way the recovery phase is led. Matthew, on your point, maybe it does make us re-question transport infrastructure. I mean, from a, a British port's point of view, you know, I think we, we may be celebrating fewer cars on the roads, but there's a lot of freight going around on the roads in delivery vans at the moment. And I wouldn't be, we mustn't argue our, ourselves out of the, the gains we've, we've made on HS2 or Northern Powerhouse Rail. That infrastructure is going to be needed. Mm -hmm. And obviously it will create jobs in a moment when the country will need jobs. And it's an agreement we've got and we should bank it and we, we go with it. But I do think kind of more beyond that, it might make us think more about, as I said, cycling and walking uh, infrastructure uh, in, our, in our communities uh, and digital infrastructure. You know, Judith's right. Why should we be assuming that it's right to jump in a car to go to a meeting or a, a train miles away? I think some of these changes are the things that we need to, um, we need to, to, to consider. I think we're going to have to be prepared to challenge assumptions in this phase you know things that we've almost taken for granted are going to have to be revisited i think and i think that's just a reality of where we where we are sati your question i think is a really good one about housing the nature of housing if people are going to be working more from home that implies things for for, for housing i think there are big opportunities with regard to retrofitting and possibly housing improvement alongside it if we're looking at job creation in this uh, period we're about to, to enter. So the opportunity I think for housing uh, might be that we don't just make it uh, zero carbon, but we also improve it uh, at the same time, recognizing as you say that too many people are living in homes which put their health at risk. So health generally needs to come much higher up the list here, doesn't it? You know, we should be, help work should not be damaging people's health housing should not be damaging people's health as a country we need to be prioritizing everybody's health physical and mental and therefore housing is fundamental to people's health and their ability to live uh, a good life so yeah. you know, I, I think that from an economic renewal point of view needs to come forward because housing is a thing that we can kind of get moving and moving quickly from a job creation point of view uh, but at the same time, I think we need to have a, a big vision for how housing, good housing supports people's uh, health and, and well-being and yeah. affords the benefit of home working to, to as many people as possible, just not, not just people in middle class professional uh, careers. We've, we've had a, we had a terrible thing with our uh, GMP com computer system. You may have seen it in the news. But actually, one thing it has allowed is much more home working for GMP staff. Uh, those who are on the uh, 101 or 999 service and you know we've got to get to a position of trust with people uh, why have we always stood against home working it's because possibly we don't trust that they're going to work <laughs> properly when they're at home i don't know it's because like the window cleaner turns up isn't it judith and you get distracted <laughs> with uh, things like that but I, I think we need to sort of think differently about washing machine 
people in their homes doing more in, the, in their communities and not unnecessarily getting in a car and driving 30 miles to get into work every morning and but if we are going to do that investing in people's homes and their communities becomes more important as well so i think the the, the summary answer is we're going to have to challenge a lot of assumptions that we had going into this and be prepared to rethink the priorities but you know don't talk ourselves out of the gains though because i think judith and i have been through enough pain on hs2 and npr yeah, and, uh, exactly. uh, we don't want to go backwards on, on that one but yeah, but I, jill last point from me in some ways just just to pick up will's question again we're gonna to have to remake the case for leveling up i'm afraid it went yeah. right off the agenda in this response phase gone mm. london-centric response definitely and I, and I, you know, I think given what's happening, it's going to be, I'm afraid, the areas where the economy is weakest, I think Judith was touching on this, that might be hit hardest by what, what's happening. So levelling up has to come back with a vengeance. And we have to be the priority for this investment in digital infrastructure, cycling infrastructure, housing. And you, Devo Connect, are going to have to lead the charge for us on that. You know, we're, we're going to have to um, uh, yeah. remake this argument, but with, a, with greater urgency. So, yeah. sorry, Jill, I've, I've realised... I've... No, but it's been fantastic. That's really, really, really good points. And, okay. yeah, definitely levelling up and the great recovery, devolution, it all goes together. Um, yeah. You know, that's we've got, to, we've got to work together. And you um, heard it here first. It's not get Brexit done anymore. It's build back better. Has everybody got the slogan? Build so... back better. I like it. Three words. <laughs> all right. OK. <laughs> all right, cheers, yeah. Andy. OK. Bye, Thanks. Bye Judith. Uh, OK, now how's the window cleaner going? <laughs> Um, I've, I've got about 10 more minutes as well, Jill. So yeah, okay. um, I, I was just thinking other people have cute kids coming in and uh, <laughs> interrupting them in these situations and uh, <laughs> not in my case. Um, should I respond? Um, Will, yeah. thank you um, for your question. And uh, of course I should, as Chair of course, as I've mentioned the great document that we're submitting, Strengthening the Core, which um, is starting to um, lay out our um, our sort of proposals of, um, you know, looking at, you know, really building on the work we've been doing through the Core Cities Network um, with our regions and with our districts um, in terms of how we really come together to, um, to move the economies of our areas um, forward. Um, we, I think we, we have been getting recognition and it would just be such a tragedy if the current situation um, forced us backwards on this agenda at all. I, I honestly don't think that that, um, that can happen. The um, sheer scale of what the country is going to have to go through, I think means that um, you know, we, we will have to be listened to um, at a local level. And you know, different areas will come out of the lockdown in different ways and um, will respond in different ways and will be successful in some areas and not so much in others. And it's that local dimension, um, I think that um, uh, will, government will, you know, really must acknowledge and they must start freeing up um, our powers locally. So we're not um, dependent on decisions going down to Whitehall. We have, we'll have to um, be able to act swiftly um, and appropriately to um, new opportunities as well as challenges that come our way but we need to be organized and um, make sure that we're taking um, everyone everyone with us but um, um, I think um, um, you know we've made the case for many years now uh, in terms of rebalancing um, the economy of the UK um, you know of course it is in particular but obviously other areas as well are, are absolutely instrumental in um, in in that rebalancing, and for too long, we've been uh, we haven't been allowed to flourish and develop to our full potential. So, going on to Matthew's point, obviously, transport infrastructure has been really recognised as a, a key factor that's been holding us back um, for 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 um, generations. So, um, having got this far, and um, you know, got you know so the green light on so many different schemes. Um, you know, we really can't afford um, to slip back on that. And I know, um, in spite of um, our focus, obviously, in dealing with the um, um, with the crisis immediately, um, work is still ongoing. 
um, on the big projects. You'll have heard the announcements about HS2 um, last week, I think. And um, we know from talking to Network Rail, to all of the other areas that, you know, significant amount of work is happening. Um, but again, you know, we need, we need the government to be responsive. So we've got um, um, deadlines on spend on certain infrastructure projects projects and we just they just have to relax those deadlines and acknowledge that you know there has been a delay and there will be that we're really concerned about the supply chain when we do get back out you know you know how many of the companies along the way um have been um have been um um, um you know put in a position where they can't respond immediately um so um you know, I, I, you know, we'll be doing everything we can to keep the pressure up, but obviously um, the financial impact is going to have a bearing and um, we'll have to um, keep a very close eye on how that um, moves forward. But there is, in all, you know, there is growing pressure for active travel, if you like. We keep mentioning it as every um, transport for the North Board, you know, cycling, walking, the hierarchy, you know, pedestrians. And I think now, you know, there is a recognition yeah. that this does need to move on. Um, Sat is absolutely right to raise housing and housing is absolutely central to the inclusive growth agenda. Um, and, you know, we'll all have seen the footage on television of people, families living in high rise accommodation with children, trying to cope with children at home, be in isolation, trying to get them to do some um, some constructive work around their schooling whilst they're trying to um, work as well. Um, it, it, it's just um, heartbreaking to see it, but we know um, as well that it's very likely that one of the reasons um, around the, the um, clusters, if you like, of high death rates is going to relate to overcrowding. Um, and, and those are all issues that we need to take forward. So yes, let's... Um, let's um, really use this as an opportunity to get to grips with um, our housing market. It is essential um, to provide quality housing, um, but we mustn't forget the private rented sector either. And so many of the, the housing, the accommodation is, in, um, is unregulated and we need to make sure that that's part of the package around the improvements for housing going forward. Okay, that's great. Um, I'm just going to, um, can we get Ariana Giovanni um, up? Yes, brilliant. Um, Ariana's got a really good question, I think, which uh, will tie it in. I'm also uh, noticing we've got 24 questions, but I'll try as far as possible to, to, to bring you in. Um, but Ariana, can you give us your question? Hi, hello, yes. Um, as both Andy and, and Judith have emphasized, the COVID-19 outbreak has brought into sharp relief the crucial role of local government and subnational governance at large in responding to the crisis. But we've clearly seen in the past weeks that the government almost instinctive reaction has been to recentralize further. Yeah. So we all agree that this should not happen, but what needs to be done in practice to ensure that the current crisis can be used as an opportunity to rethink central local relations and gives the subnational governance the power of funding and indeed also the status and respect that it deserves. So how can we turn the current situation into an opportunity to push for further devolution? Okay, uh, Judith. Judy. I'm really, really sorry. I had to Got come it. off. Okay. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah, this, is, this has never happened before. Um, sorry, Ariana, I didn't get the drift of your... It's, your... It, it's around devolution, local government, uh, role, how can we... It's, it's a, the broader question, I suppose. But Ariana, come back very quickly. Yes, so the, the, the key point was like, we, are, we agree that there shouldn't be further recentralization, but what needs to be done in practice to make sure that the current crisis can be used as an opportunity to rethink central local relation and give subnational government uh, governance the power funding and also the status and respect that it deserves. So how yeah. can we turn this into an opportunity to push for further devolution? Yeah, I, well, I think, we've, I think we've all got live examples of where we've delivered locally, uh, responding to the crisis and we need to, um, all of us in our different areas need to get a hold of those real live examples, weave it into the narrative, and make sure everyone is repeating 
that message that you know local works and it's you know the reason we've been able to come through with you know um it's no coincidence that the nhs has had capacity for example because we've been working at a local level to release that capacity with all of our partners um it, that's an, a, a a really good example of how we you know we we can be empowered when we're working together locally but you know we we have to be vigilant we have to be really on it and working on it now um, looking at the um, devolved uh, powers that we have now and making the case for extending those across a much wider area. There are areas that really haven't got that far yet. They need to um, come, you know, level up, if you like, but then we need to really um, articulate devolution in its true sense that we, so we've absolutely got the powers, the resource, um, and the wherewithal to crack on and do what we ne know needs to be done. Yeah. Okay. Hey, that's that's brilliant. Thanks. Thanks very much, Ariane. Do you have to go now, Judith? Yes, I do. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, that's right. But thanks ever so much. I think we've had a really good debate. And then we'll move on to uh, the next part of this discussion. Um, we've got the, the last half an hour. So thanks very much. Uh, and thanks uh, for that. I think what we'll do now, because I, I, there's over 25 people who uh, have posted questions, and I want to call on uh shortly i think uh if laurie quinn you're still there um we will uh get you up uh jonathan uh i want to bring in sort of uh the role of universities education um uh, a little bit more obviously on health i think i've got phil hope um as well former social care minister i think is on so if i say jonathan davis laurie quinn um and phil hope and beth perry uh if we can add you uh get you ready to um uh ask your ask a question um not necessarily a question now it's more let's uh make some points um and uh you know between steve and i let's sort of if we can build on the q a with andy uh to, to take this debate forward uh, you know, what the other side will look like, what we've got to do, what the recovery, I think we've done that. But before we do that, and while you're still on, uh, we're going to do a straw poll question. So if we can line that up, uh, Emily, um, here we go. Uh, so uh, fingers on the buzzer. Um, are you confident that the government alone can lead us out of the COVID-19 crisis and deliver the rate? great recover, recovery. I'm assuming that a lot of people will say no <laughs> without leading you. So uh, if you want to do that, I don't know how long it takes to come through. Uh, oh, I'm going to do it. There we are. Emily? Yeah, I'll um I'll launch the results just when it's finished. So if you want to sort of carry on and then I'll Okay. So who have we got lined up now? Uh let's just go that down. So we've had ah, so um my very good friends Laurie and Phil. Uh shall we go to Laurie first? Thanks, Jill. Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Um I just make an observation. Uh, some of my questions were around really how uh, Cobra has been performing and, and Andy had great experience of that from when he was a minister. But it strikes me that uh, this has demonstrated just how denuded uh, the Whitehall system has been. The, uh, the fact that the civil servants just haven't been able to, to cope with the crisis. Mm. Um, and uh, quite a lot of uh, what we've heard in recent days seems to be pointing to almost uh, the military having to come in to, to take over. Uh, we saw the first time a guy in uniform at the conference yesterday. Mm. Um, that, that was symbolic of trying to steady a ship that was all over the place. But some of the, uh, some of the things that the last Labour government left in terms of civil contingencies, in terms of crisis management planning, etc. cetera, and, and, and personally I was involved in putting the legislation through for the uh, 2004 Civil Contingencies Bill and the stockpiles of things that Labour left for a crisis like this, that has been very badly denuded and not replenished uh, during the austerity years as Judith 
quite clearly said. But most, most importantly, the skill sets and the ability to respond to a crisis uh, in terms of Whitehall and central government. I think, if anything, that strengthens the, the argument for uh, devolution, strengthens the argument for, for local delivery. And I'll just give one example that people might want to think about. After the problems of Katrina in New Orleans um, some years ago, after the, uh, the big problems there, it was actually the local government that brought that economy back. It wasn't wasn't the state, it wasn't the central government or the federal government, it was actually very much local initiatives and it was local businesses that, uh, that actually did that and I think there's an awful lot of similar examples of uh, where crisis management and recovery has changed but we have to learn the lessons and we can't go back, it's not just a restart, it's a reboot if you, if you want in a phrase. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, I think some very, very good points points there. Um, Steve, did you want to come back on uh, anything that's been said so far before I bring in bring in others? No, no, no. Let's 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 hear from Phil and others. And then okay. Ask... All right. So sorry. I'm sorry. These are all former MPs, important folk. But Phil Hope, uh, how are you? Hi, hi, Jill. Yeah, that's, that's very kind for you. Uh, <laughs> have a go. Um, oh, I just wanted to uh, draw everyone's attention to the health. Devolution Commission, which Devo Connect is uh, the secretariat to, and which we've got cross-party support from former health ministers, Tory, Labour and Liberal, and, um, uh, and really um, ask people to uh, contribute to that, because when we, we were asked the question about how we're going to you know, come out of this and have a, a voice and be heard, I think the, the Devolution Commission will be one, one sort of vehicle for making sure that lessons get learned and we go forward in the right way. Crucially for me, COVID has um, really exposed both the huge kind of divide between health and social care in terms of attention, funding, priority. Anyone, with only people now are just beginning to care about people dying in care homes when all the attention has been uh, in the NHS. Now, this is something that Healthy Evolution, the stuff that Andy's doing and uh, Judith's doing in Leeds and elsewhere are really trying to grapple with, but COVID has really exposed the, the complete silos that these two systems still operating after 20 years of us discussing how we should integrate them better. So um, that's the first thing. The second thing is I, the COVID has really exposed how the health and the economic prosperity are totally and directly linked. Yeah. If you have an unhealthy workforce, you don't have a prosperous economy. If you don't have a prosperous economy, people are going to get ill, they're, they're mentally ill, you know, and so on. So the link between health and economic prosperity is absolutely now out there. I mean, we've had the Marmot report, we've had loads of people saying it, but now we're actually living it in a way that just can't be denied. The, the burning debt is something we are actually in right now, and we can't go back to normal. Going back to normal means we just no, no change. And of course, we can't just be talking about health services, health and social care services. It's about improving the community's health. I mean, public health, which has been you know, decimated in terms of funding and support, uh, that needs to, so you've got this combination, this opportunity now, uh, to really grasp a much more profound and strategic way of thinking and then for a way of delivering stronger local communities. And so we just can't do all this from the top down. I was a minister. I used to have levers to pull and things to do, and it doesn't work. <laughs> you have yeah. to, things have to happen at the, on the ground. There are dilemmas. You do need strong national leadership. You might need national targets. So you might have to have some tightness at the top but you need looseness at the bottom. You need people to be freed with power, responsibility and resources to make things happen that are relevant and responsive to their local communities, not least in terms of successful health and economic strategies at a local level. So um, my plea would be, uh, let's get a cross-party uh, support behind this. You know, we've got a Conservative government for the next four years. Um, yeah. We've got good uh, uh, um, uh, mayors uh, and uh, combined authorities controlled by the different political parties. We've got new Conservative MPs uh, in northern seats that weren't there before. I think this is a moment when you've got to bring that coalition together to a strong voice, uh, showing that this direction of travel, I mean, we've got the Health Devolution Commission, but everyone's saying we can't go back to the way things were because... COVID has ruthlessly exposed how inadequate that is and how it won't be the answer for the future. Yeah, absolutely. Um, thanks, for, thanks for that. Oh, we've got the response just in uh, and a unanimous uh, no. <laughs> the, 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 the government can't do it alone. Um, and I think that is a very strong 
message uh, and just two two people just didn't didn't know the answer, which is fair enough. Um, but I think in push they probably join and, uh, and say no. Uh, anyway, let's. I think I think we've done a bit of housing, done a bit of housing, um, health and transport. But let's talk, um, Jonathan Davis. You're, I mean, just uh, if you're there, um, if we can bring you in, uh, looking at, at, at education. We also had uh, Peter O'Brien from York, Yorkshire Universities. Uh, said what role uh, should local universities be playing in order to support the economic recovery. Uh, so I thought maybe you had, a, um, I think Beth also had a similar thing about uh, the role of education and impact on education. Obviously there's a lot of uh, students who paid a lot of money, including student nurses, uh, for basically uh, things that they're not going to, to have. Um, so um, I'll go to Jonathan. Um, Hello, can you hi. hear me? Yes. Yeah. Uh, uh, thank, thank you. Thank you for picking me out. Um, I, I'm a director of a, a small research centre at uh, De Montfort University called the Centre for Urban Research on Austerity, um, uh, which is based in Leicester. And, uh, the the centre kind of does what it says it does. Uh, but we, we have a number, we're kind of having a number of discussions at our university and in our centre, uh, uh, which my colleague Ariana is also involved in. Uh, around the role of the academic community. Uh, so, uh, of course, there's the question about students that uh, you just mentioned, Jill. Mm. Uh, universities are also extremely important actors in their communities, and we are yeah. developing an effort to, uh, to really do our very, very best on that front to support local recovery efforts. Uh, but I'm also, as, a, as the, a, the director of a research centre, interested in what we should be doing research-wise, what kind of knowledge, beyond the scientific and medical knowledge, what kind of knowledge and research do we need to try and develop uh, to support uh, cities, to support local government in the coming months and years? What sort of problems should we be looking at uh, through, our research in, uh, through our research efforts? Yeah. I think there's such a big focus on innovation or will be in all aspects of life. And it's been, uh, you know, quite incredible, um, you know, how in some areas we've responded so quickly and innovatively. But again, it goes back to the broader point about how you recalibrate priorities uh, moving forward. Um, indeed. Can I bring in Beth, Beth Perry? Is it similar? I think it's a similar area you're interested in. Uh, yeah. You're from Sheffield, aren't you? I yeah, am. Um, I'm from the Sheffield Urban Institute, where I'm co-director. Um, yeah, I'll come in on Jonathan's point, and then I also wanted to raise an, another point, if I may, as well. Um, I mean, I think there's two things to bear in mind when we think about how universities can contribute to their local economies, local communities. Um, the first is that usually when we look at the history of uh, universities and their engagement, it's the people that are in universities that are doing the engagement, and they're either... Um, facilitated and enabled by their universities to do that or they're constrained. Um, it's not usually the whole institution that's having that impact. What we then need to look at at the moment is that as universities funding is being remarkably reduced, universities are putting pressure on us all to find savings. This is even before we're hit by the impact of the reduction in international student fees and tuition fees. Um, we're actually in a situation where some of the margins for creativity are actually diminishing. So I, we've been having similar conversations to the ones that Jonathan's had about where is the space for discretion for us to actually do things differently. Um, and with that in mind, we had um, a conversation actually yesterday with 30 international colleagues from urban research centres around the world, um, from Jakarta, from Delhi, from Beirut, from Mumbai, from Cape Town. And we were all talking about the way in which our institutes can actually respond to this current moment. And usually it's to do with how embedded we are already in those communities, but it's also to do with how our institutions are going to support us to do it. So there's a whole set of tensions there. And we really do need to rethink not only what the questions are, which is what Jonathan's saying, but also how do we even do that research? Because a lot of the research we might need to do involves being out and about, engaging with communities, um, developing projects collaboratively um, and we can't be there so how do you do that kind of in-depth work at a distance so I think there's a whole set of challenges there as well um, the other thing I just wanted to bring in was 
I think it's really critical, obviously, that we tackle uh, this question around further devolution and avoiding the recentralization um, in, in the context of, of COVID-19. Um, but I'm equally interested in what that means for relationships between local authorities and citizens um, beyond the ballot box. Um, since you know, devolution, we've seen increasing powers and responsibilities going from Whitehall to the Town Hall. And we've been looking in Greater Manchester at how citizens can get involved in decision making themselves, what kind of social innovation can take place, um, how we can move from kind of ideas around consultation to more co-productive forms of decision making. And there is beginning to be some really good examples of that in Greater Manchester. So I'm equally keen to understand what does this actually mean for those kinds of developments? What does it mean for citizen participation? And that we don't actually go backwards on that score as well. Um, and forget that it's, it's about involving citizens meaningfully in some of these decisions as well. Yeah, very, very good. Does that, Steve, do you want to come back on any of those no, points? Uh, well, just, I think, just briefly, just to say, I think the um, key thing is, and it came through in Andy and Judith's point and in all these points here, which is that there is this uh, incredibly strong centralising tendency. Uh, I think Andy mm -hmm. put it very well when he said, obviously, that's understandable in an emergency. But I think we're going to have to really struggle and keep doing things like this, but use every avenue we can in order to get the uh, point across that actually the only way the recovery will happen is if it is a huge collaborative uh, effort. Yeah. Uh, that it's not competition. And I mean, some of the things obviously are about, you know, community have got to be at the centre of this. Local government's got to be at the centre of this combined. And just going back to one of the questions about how we make that case. Uh, and, and again, the point about the fact that we've got to remake the point for levelling up and for devolution and being involved is there. But I think things like the M9, Sadiq Khan, Andy Street, uh, working with the LGA, you know, we've just got to work very close together and actually make sure that that tendency amongst the government uh, to just think they can do it all from a bunker, that they're uh, disabused of that. Yeah. Uh, that's true. I just wonder, is, is Hannah Davis uh, still still uh, there? Uh, if so, can you unmute and come forward? Uh, there's a couple of questions around volunteering. Um, going a little bit back on the health, um, but also uh, a few points around resilience, uh, which I think when I'd like to pick up. Uh, I think Mike Leonard and Lauren Webb, if you're there, uh, unmute or put your hands up and we'll we'll find you whilst we're doing that um can we just i'm gonna also ask for another poll question in a minute so we need to get that lined up uh and then we'll probably run out of time uh let's see who we've got hannah davis uh let's Hi. let's go to you and perhaps pick up on some of the points that um you know have been made but also for uh, as phil was talking uh, as well okay yeah, no, that's that's great. And I think it would be very useful. So I'm from the Northern Health Science Alliance, which is an alliance of the hospitals and universities across the north of England and the academic health science network. And yeah. um, I think um, it would be useful for Phil and I to have a conversation um, on this. So um, I think health has traditionally been left out of the more um, of most noise around Northern Powerhouse and obviously the fact that only um, Manchester has devolved health has had an impact on that but um, I think this crisis very much clearly shows that health needs to be a part of all discussions and that um, health isn't just the NHS it's also the public health um, as um, one of your participants said earlier it's housing it plays into all kinds of things um, and also the fact that the North has, um, over half the North has worse health inequality than the worst area in the South of England. And we know already from stats that are coming out that people who suffer from the greatest health inequalities are more disproportionately affected by COVID. So there are huge elements around health that need to be considered when it comes to evolution and um, local authorities. So, um, I'd be interested to know what people think um, local authority and devolved administrations, what 
they need to push for in terms of health, how also they are linking in with their NHS leaders. So I know there are links, but across the north, it's not as clear. And, you know, it tends to be a bit separate in some respects as well. So the health leaders will do their things, the university leaders, and then the um, local authorities. So, um, yeah, I'd be interested to get um, perspectives on that. Yeah, I mean, particularly on that, I think it would be good for you to hook up with Steve and uh, Phil uh, and to probably have that conversation a bit more offline because it'd be really good uh, to get your involvement and your perspective. Um, so two very quick questions. Um, uh, Mike and Lauren, I think is looking around um, resilience in the system. Uh, so I'll go to Mike. How are you? I'm very well. How are you? Yeah, nice Not bad. Great <laughs> yeah, conference. Well done. Um, so yeah, um, lack of resilience has been a, a key uh, concern during the whole of this uh, COVID-19 uh, crisis. Um, and that sort of manifests itself in all sorts of ways, but not least uh, you know, the fact that we can't even make uh, scale PPE in this country. We have to import it from uh, China, would you believe, and yeah. Turkey and other places. Yeah. Um, and, and I just wonder how that's, uh, you know, how we coming out of this into this new normal and this reset button, we start to think about the manufacturing businesses that we've still got left in the UK, how we invest in them, support them. You know, going prior to going into this, we talked about a northwest corridor of uh, modern methods of construction, which effectively would bring in lightweight steel and timber houses in from as far away as Japan to replace the houses that we build from the materials that we make in the UK. That has yeah. got to be a nonsense going forward, given that uh, uh, resilience is, is going to be key and local uh, communities and, uh, and the jobs that it creates are also key, I think, to, uh, to do success. Yeah, no, I mean, it, it's, it has actually just show, it shed such uh, a light, shone a light on so many sort of, uh, you know, whys. <laughs> Yeah. Why Why is that? And uh, whatever. Anyway, over. I'm just going to quickly bring in Lauren. How are you? Hi, Jill. Hi. 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 Um, I work for Electricity Northwest and we are responsible for the energy, well, electricity network uh, in the Northwest. Um, I think my two points were well, firstly, Obviously, the definition of key worker is very wide. I think, you know, don't get me wrong, hail all the great work that the NHS are doing, but I think it's, I think Judith touched on it. It's not just the NHS, it's the, you know, your, um, the retail sector. Yeah. All, all different sectors, but I think also, um, as coming from a bar like Lecture to Northwest and the wider energy sector, we are also uh, we are are critical to the um, UK and our region in respect of keeping your, the power going, uh, reducing those power cuts. Um, support we have supported also um, the creation of the Nightingale at um, Manchester Central, making sure they've got a stable um, electricity supply to do all their good work. So it's kind of that's what we're here and now, um, you know, coping with and responding to COVID. But also, my other point was, um, if we're going to change the way we work, where we live, we've got to think about um, the electricity uh, supply, the electricity network in terms of working from home, video conferencing. But also, if you do have to travel, electric vehicles. Yeah. Um, also, you know, the big thing I know for Andy Burnham is the uh, achieving the net zero um, target. Target. Yeah. Well, so it's you know we got to kind of use this opportunity, like again, what Andy's saying is let's build back for the better rather than you know than reverting the back to the ways we were previously. Yeah. No, all really, really, really good points there. I think, uh, you know, I think uh, it's been a really positive discussion. Uh, I think uh, where we, the way we define things, the way we look at things, uh, how we prioritise, how we recalibrate, we do come through the other side. Uh, it's just going to be a phenomenal challenge. Yes. Um, but I think... Uh, you know, what, one thing I think is clear from this debate uh, today is that, uh, you know, devolution is a part of meeting that challenge and must be, uh, you know, moving forward. 
uh, absolutely must be. I think, you know, uh, that's why at the, at the beginning I was talking about how we reprioritize things and what's important to us, uh, you know, how we interact, uh, you know, what we do, where we go on holiday or don't go on holiday. Uh, you know, there are some positive benefits, but also it's going to be a very, very different world to, to how we remember remember it. I'm just going to quickly, if you're still there with your buzzers, so there's one more question. So, and it run, and it goes a little bit like this. Uh, will the impact of COVID-19 and our response, responses nationally in our city regions and local authorities strengthen the case for more devolved powers in recovery? I think, again, the answer will be yes, um, but let's see what you say. I'm going to switch over quickly to, uh, uh, he doesn't know this, but I'm going to ask Steve just to do uh, a few thoughts uh, while we get the results uh, of that question. I better, I better answer it as well. There you go. <laughs> um, well, my thoughts are really useful, really interesting debate. We've got a long way to go. I like the idea of build back better. Uh, I think... Um, I don't know, these three word mantras are all <laughs> fine, but we do need to kind of explain what that means. And we need to kind of get behind the sort of vision. I think it's very interesting. Uh, I've been reading quite a lot of stuff about, uh, from Claire's who are very uh, positive about the opportunities this provides to create a more community led and local kind of economies. We've heard from core cities very positive about uh, the roles of cities and about the support that's needed, but for their wider areas. So I think we've got to try and come behind. Obviously, in a way, it's like, you know, let's have this debate, let's have lots of ideas, but ultimately we're going to, going back to what I was saying before, I think we're going to have to have a very strong case for what building back better means. And obviously what it does mean is part of it is about who is building back better. And I think we've heard loud and true here that that has got to involve combined authorities, it's got to involve local authorities, and also it's got to involve people, communities much more. Yeah, absolutely. So Emily, have we got a result to the poll? No. Okay. Oh yes, we do, there we are. There's a, uh, another resounding majority in the yes department. Um, uh, only a few saying no, and a lot saying don't know because yeah, probably the real answer is we don't know but um you know we can at this stage hopefully uh, hopefully we have sort of started that debate about the future uh whatever that might look like uh we will hopefully for all of those people thank you so so much for for joining us today uh for those people who've asked questions we'll run through them and keep in dialogue with you. Uh, this is being recorded and there'll be lots of tweets and other things that will come uh, come through. So it only really remains uh, for me to thank one and all uh, for joining today. Uh, it's great to hear your voices. Um, it's a shame we can't see each other in person, but um, it's been really good to, to catch up today and have such a, a fulsome and I think a little bit optimistic uh, in terms of the discussion that we've had. So thank you. And a particular thanks to uh, Emily for making the technology work so smoothly. So um, thank you, everybody. And have a good afternoon. Thank you. Goodbye, everyone. <laughs> Bye. Bye.